Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the EBA webinar podcast series. My name is Aaron Smith, and I'm joined, as always, by Nancy Bakeman. And we're really pleased to have the entertaining and informative Teresa Lopez with Green Energy Money back again for uh, round two. If you missed round one, that is posted at the EBA Academy website. It's also in the Better Homes, Better Future podcast. Before you ask me, you know, put all questions in the Q&A. We will have this recorded. It'll be on the EBA Academy. We'll have a copy of the PDF there as well. But Teresa, we were talking as we opened up that this is one of the most critical areas for builders to really get a handle on, to understand how to properly value the high performance things that they do in their houses. And I, I learned some new lingo from you last time, not have the uh, appraisals bust out. So I think it's just an absolutely timely topic. Um, it's a great subject. And we're so pleased to have you back again. Well, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the members of EBA. And um, I hope this information helps you and helps all of us to evolve to the high performance story of being recognized as it should be. <laughs> so um, I'll go ahead and get started. So for those of you, you that don't know me, I've been a licensed mortgage banker for many, many decades now and uh, too many to count and seen lots of different market um, conditions and really have to say I haven't seen anything as unusual as this particular market is, but my specialty is green economics and I have a company called Green Energy Money, but I also work on the national lending side and um, have developed a green economic way to value uh, green high performance building, which is kind of my claim to fame, I guess, or <laughs> infamy in some way. Um, so marketing as, as, as education is really where I um, thrive and have a lot of passion for, as I'm sure you'll probably see in a minute or two. So the first thing I want to cover is what we what I do, because it's a very, a lot of people go, I, I love what you're doing, but I don't really understand it. So the first thing is that we do solve the problems of green appraisals with valuation. So we've come up with a way to value a home that is quantifiable, certifiable, and have since 2014 successfully um, done these appraisals. We work with a national appraisal company and panel. So we have the ability to expand in all 50 states and different regions. It is a little bit, um, you know, on a regional play, um, complex because we have to train the appraiser. And then on the lending side, we also work nationally with many different companies. I'll share at the end some of the agencies that we you know, sold these loans to with no buybacks, I want to add, which is quite a story or in and of itself um, that the appraisals seem to be accepted in the marketplace when you have the right team. So I will share that more on that. Um, later, but we are always bringing new loan products and new um, opportunities and incentivize financing to the marketplace and finding ways to bring it together so that it all works on a cohesive and incentivized way and actually rewards people rather than punishes them. I've spoke about education as um, marketing as education. So we train builder sales teams, lender training, we do appraisal training and um, and bring, uh, bring to the marketplace a way for people to understand how to quantify the value and, and know what this product represents. We also offer quality assurance by virtue of the types of um, data and appraisals and, and um, quantification processes that we've developed, methodology, if you will. So we have a qualified workforce of appraisers, lenders, and realtors, and we're looking for more realtors. And we were, we're going to be expanding to a retrofit program um, in the next few months. And I'm working on some things for retrofits on a regional play. And I'm interested in talking to anyone that's in that space. Um, so first thing is, what's the challenge on green high-performance building? Um, we've got you know, there's a lot of fragmented information. We've got antiquated pair sales, a com um, comparable analysis, which is I'm going to go into here into in a minute, apples to oranges. 
lack of inventory because most of the higher performance homes the net zero, the SIPs, the ICF are primarily in the custom um, home area. They're not listed on the MLS. So there's no inventory for them. And realtors don't have inventory either. So there's this missing sales comparison that is not as incomplete and there's a there's a market reaction to it not being relevant because they can't see the database of all the different high performance homes that are in the market cuz typically people buy the land and sell them or don't sell the property they build on it and they stay in them for a long time what is an appraisal how does an appraisal work so the first thing is there's there's sales methods so the sales comparison which is what i alluded to before, for the sales um, comparison approach, the cost approach, and the income approach. Um, I want to just drive this home. If there were any takeaways I wanted you to go away today with, this is one of them. The appraisal valuation is supposed to be an unbiased opinion of value, but that isn't always hold true because most appraisers are biased when it comes to high performance building and they're like, there's not a lot of data in here. I just had this happen recently on appraisal that the appraiser put in their opinion that there was no market for this in Florida, which is totally not true. Mm -hmm. So they just were misinformed. So there is bias. They're not supposed to be biased and they're supposed to be a fair market value reflection with those types of um, of measures that are in the property. It's also based on location, age, square footage, condition, you know, terms, upgrades. But on the upgrades, the high performance measures are never pretty much missing within the sales approach because of, they're not being listed or told or somehow translated to the appraiser. So the first thing is the sales comparison I talked to you about. This is the most common way that appraisals are done. So these are only for residential, by the way, and second homes or, you know, or rental properties, but they're one to four units. So the comparison takes the similar houses hold, sold and it, and it compares them to unique characteristics, like how many square feet, it, feet is it? What kind of lot is it on? Does it have a view? Does it have a swimming pool? All the different attributes that would be included in a home. The second is the cost approach. This is the one that should be used more readily for new construction homes because we're looking at the comparison of the cost of land, cost of construction. The problem with the sales comparison on new construction is you're looking back to sales a year before. And so it's always going backwards. So you're not seeing reflected today the cost that's gone up you're not seeing in the new valuation. So therefore, a lot of the appraisals will come in low on new construction because they're not looking at the difference in the, um, you know, the price points that have gone up. And the third is the income cap capital capitalization approach, better known as the cap approach. So this is for commercial or income producing properties and it examines the rental income, operating expenses, things like that. So that is, you know, when you're doing a new construction with a, a, on a rental property, this would be one of the methodologies that would be used also for commercial property, you know, multifamily, this is would be the, the, um, the, the way that they would um, approach the valuation. So um, the second takeaway I'd like to bring to the, the audience here is that the air policy, the appraisal independent requirement. So this is something that nobody really understands and, and you can actually tell your lender or the appraiser, if once they assign the appraiser, if he calls to go and inspect the property and he does not know how to do a green appraisal and is not skilled in the art of, of an analysis of a unique subject property type, you can actually deny that appraiser and say you, do, you would like to have another appraiser assigned. The problem with that is you have an incompetent lender in most cases who's also assigning it to an incompetent appraiser. Not saying they're not competent in the conventional space, they're just not competent in the high performance building space. And many of them aren't, aren't really that competent on construction as well. So doing a regular rotation of appraisers doesn't work for this market. 
which is why we have our own special green panel appraiser. And because of the competency ruling on the selection process, we're allowed to go outside of that realm and qualify, um, use our own panel of appraisers who are competent and have done the training and have, we have vetted and are now on the green panel. So that is something that's very precious and extremely, um, I'm honored that, that we have such an amazing um, group of people that are able to facilitate these orders. We work with a national appraisal management company. So there's all regulations and everything is separated out and all you know, buttoned down to be in regulatory compliance. So in 2011, this is a walk down memory lane here, um, Fannie Mae adopted the new UAD uniform appraisal data set. And they added a whole new section to the appraisal and expanded on the appraisal during the 2011 and September. Um, they added the sales type, whether it was distress, was it a relocation, was it a uh, real estate, you know, shortage or sold an REO? Were there mark? What were the market trends? Was it, how many days on market was it? Was it declining? Is it a declining? You're going to see this more, by the way, as values start to decline a little bit from the crazy world we just um, exited. So declining, um, if it's a declining market or if there's a shortage in the market. So all of those market trends are noted in the appraisal valuations beginning in 11. They also added a C rating for the condition of the appraisal. They added a Q rating for the quality rating. They added an energy efficiency line item, which I applaud Fannie, Fannie's efforts and Freddie and you know, FHA and everyone that um, has adapted to this or adopted this method, but they did not give it a rating. And they said energy efficiency items, if there's none, if it lists them on the line, well, when you see the line, I'm going to show you in a few minutes, it's really tiny and there's no way you can list energy efficiency items on this grid. And um, if there's none and or none, if it's or typical. So you will see if you go and look at any appraisals that you've ever had done on your own units in the past, you're going to see none or typical on that energy efficiency line item dating back to a 2011. The appraisers misinterpreted that language. And therefore, I've seen appraisals that have been sent to me that have none or typical where there's visibly solar on the roof. So I'm just saying that does come back to the competency ruling again. So we came up with a way to bring the HERS in. For you guys that don't know HERS, please go and study it. I've got a lot of information on greenenergy.money's website. I'm sure um, Aaron and, and Eva probably has a lot of um, data about it. I recommend always starting with the HERS Raider. I love the HERS Raiders. They're my tribe, my my everything. I couldn't do what we do without the HERS community. So we quantified this um, energy, um, the energy on the on the energy line item through the HERS inspection um, through an economic model and methodology. So this is recognized in most states. Um, it's in miles per gallon for your home. I, I share with every client, every builder. I've been, you know, I'm like an evangelist when it comes to her sometimes. So um, this is, you know, this, and we've just adopted the 21 code in most states now. So we're really moving along to be able, this is what's driving a lot of the market is the building codes, the IECC code in particular. So we took the IECC International Energy Conservation Code and we matched that to an E rating. So we would now have an E rating to put on the green appraisal. And this is probably one of my you know, most um, proud moments that we were able to make this work um, and aha moments and exciting. So we're able to take an E rating, which would, it, it matches the Q rating. So the Q rating one through five, five being worst or six being worst, we brought it to an E rating. And I didn't feel like E6 was necessary because E6, you can't fund it. It's a tear down. I mean, it's, there's no way. So why even bother? So this is where we were with the IECC in 06 on an E rating. So houses that were built in this timeline now can now be quantified to be able to do the adjustments on the appraisal. That's really what it's for. 
So this kind of gives you what the HERS ratings would be, you know, um, and then an E1 minus, which we're seeing these now is mm -hmm. they're producing enough utility or enough generated power now to, to charge their electric vehicles. I'm a real big proponent of the electric vehicle being used in lieu of getting credits from the, from the utility. I think it's a better use of and a better economic model to show, be able to match pr production, you know, our, our transportation rather with housing energy mm -hmm. reductions. So this is an actual case study that we did um, last year. And it's one of the better choices that I can show you. So these are the three places where you're gonna see most of the green adjustments happening. And they would be the, the Q3 and Q or Q and C, quality of construction and condition of property are, are pretty much um, standard in the industry, but it actually can be used to make better adjustments for super high quality construction would be a Q1. That would be a high-end home that's using Tesla walls and all the latest and greatest technology known to man. So that would be considered a Q1, whereas a condition, an older home, if you let this house was 17 years old, so they did an adjustment for the condition. So you go down here to the energy efficiency line item. Now we can say that this was an E1 home. The comparables were E3, E5s, they were older homes. So this is where the energy performance from the HERS rating. So the HERS told us that the energy savings was $3,700 a year. That can now be quantified on a present value formula to be able to put that adjustment on there and accordingly you know, gauge that amount by the amount that the energy savings is and depending on the, you know, whether it's an E1 or an E5. So the only way really to quantify this on appraisal, in my opinion, is with the E rating. And Fannie Mae, by the way, applauded this effort years ago when I brought this to them and said they wish they would have thought of it. So it just mm -hmm. wasn't, they just didn't understand, you know, fully how to implement it. But I think this is one of the ways that is very, very useful for appraisers. At least that's the feedback we get. When we show them how to do this and do the training on it, they, they're they just, you know, so grateful and so accepting of it. And it's worked deal over deal over deal for since 2014. So how what are the benefits of green appraisals? Well, a high performance is, you know, it's, first of all, you're going to get a better competency and, and compliant appraisal. You're getting trained and skilled that understand this. Um, it's quantified through the HERS third-party certification, which the lenders like to know that, and the appraisers really um, <laughs> are grateful for, or, or you know, um, because they're thankful for, because they have a better way to stand up the value, and they have someone else telling them what this property's performance level is. So it's really useful for the appraiser. Um, quality assurance for buyers, um, financial markets. It's also a baseline. I just shared this with a potential um, client this morning that, you know, you're going to have a baseline that stays with you for the life of your home. So if you ever sell that home, everybody goes, oh, I'm never going to sell this home. Well, life happens. I can tell you that quite a number of resales have happened from high performance building that, you know, clients have called me and I've helped them transition to get the houses listed or whatever um, because of life events. Um, so there is an importance to having a baseline where you can show your utility saving or your utility bill and kilowatt usage going forward to back up the data. So this would stay with you through the life of the home and actually transfer to the new owner if need, you know, as uh, on the sale. Um, you do get a green premium value. I can't guarantee what that value is because you can't dictate to the appraiser what they will do or not do. So the um, the interest, um, so the green premium value has been averaging between five and 8%. We have seen as high as 11, and that was for homes that were net zero plus energy production, and they were, you know, passive house or you know, something uh, ICF or structured insulated panels, super, super high performance, um, higher end kind of homes. Um, we're at 11%. Um, you can get a property um, 
a, a, an interest rate reduction or possibly PMI redu reduce because by virtue, loans are, um, or interest rates are driven by the loan to value of the property. So if your property value is 5% higher, you could get a better rate or potentially reduce the PMI. In the state of Texas, you can get a property tax reduction from proving solar rainwater harvesting and possibly insurance, homeowners insurance reductions as well. We've seen that in the marketplace, although that's harder to quantify. Um, I wanna say that there are, um, there are extra fees involved. So the green appraisal, the extra appraisal fee on top of the normal conventional fee is anywhere from $100 to $300, depending on the scope of work, what type of, you know, how much time it's gonna take, the location, if it's more rural, it's going to cost more anyway, whether it's a green property or not. If it's in, you know a harder assignment or a big assignment, um, it might cost a little bit more. But I think a one to three hundred dollar fee is about the average um, extra cost on the appraisal valuation. Um, also, you would have the HERS audit. The HERS audit again, it varies. I know in Boston they're over a thousand dollars, which kind of blows my mind. And and and. Um, in Texas, we can get the um, preliminary um, HERS audit at $450. This is preliminary based on plans and specs. It's not inclusive of your final inspection if you want to go for the full certification. Also, I want to point out that Fannie Mae, at the time of the UAD um, deployment in 2011, had a 10% what, adjustment. So what's, what's UAD again? Uniform appraisal data set. It's the 2011 where they put the E rating and the Q rating and all that in there. So that's what they call the appraisal report now, a uniform appraisal data set. That's the data that Fannie Mae is collecting overall in the marketplace now. Mm -hmm. So thanks for asking. I tend to, st I need to stop <laughs> using so many acronyms. Our, our industry loves it. I'm sorry, guys. It's just yeah, embedded okay. in me. <laughs> So, but Fannie Mae does allow up to a 15% adjustment on that appraisal. So if I go back to that grid right here, you can see on here, this was about, uh, it was eight and a half percent on the green premium. And it could have gone as high as 15%, which would have been almost double that. But of course it's based on present value. So you can see there's still room to grow as we go forward and, and performance becomes more and more the norm. Um, I covered this slide last time um, and the brown discount and green premium valuation. So this is where we are. Brown discount would be a condition rating, a C rating. Under C4 is a brown discount. A C3 would be like almost there. That means deferred maintenance, major deferred maintenance. And the next generation of the, loan, the life cycle, it's not even going to last over 30 years for lenders that are refinancing these properties now, which is really become, I think, another potential write down of the Brown discount in the near future of a lot of high, you know, uh, high deferred maintenance cost involved in these homes. So as the demand for green goes up, then we see this adaption going up. And we are seeing this, by the way. I mean, can tell you I'm, I'm in the middle of it and I see this growing and growing and growing and more adaption happening from the lend consumer and builder side and technology side, not so much on the lending side. I'm working on it. I hope I can do it in my lifetime, but there's a lot of resistance to um, evolving and to accepting and recognizing this story. So Teresa, are you saying that banks will start to look at the energy operating costs and put that into some sort of a brown discount because obviously it's total cost of ownership of the well property. they do well they do i mean you see if we go back here this one got an adjustment here um for the c rating because of the age of it so mm -hmm. you are seeing the this is actually adjustment down even though there's a plus sign that that was on this, this gave more, more value to the subject property, you know, so that's why this one was so important and that, you know, that we were able to, now I've seen C, a C4 that was discounted way more than that. And again, it depends on the appraiser. We can't dictate what the appraiser does, but 
we can certainly point them in the right direction and give them the proper data that's needed. Yeah. So like I said, a C3 to a C6 would be an obsolete. In fact, mm -hmm. if you're a C4, you can't get lending funding hardly anywhere without upgrading the property. Okay. Does that uh, answer Teresa, your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, a question that came in uh, from a net zero ready builder, uh, Joe German. They have an energy consultant. Will this data show up in the resale listing and will banks realize a green appraisal isn't needed or would you do you need a, a green appraisal so that it's a, part of the record of that property? Until there is more inventory on the property, you will need a green appraisal every time. Okay. And one of the issues that that well challenges which we're, we want to address now is in training the real estate community how to write this in a listing. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I please call me I'll help you, I just want to see this happen and so many realtors I, I've been teaching these classes to real estate agents for years and I'm. It's so funny. I get a call from Vegas five years ago. You did this training for us and I've got a green listing now. I don't know what you, I don't remember what you told me. So this is important that, you know, we write the right data in there. You don't need a special green, anything on your MLS, just put it right in the listing. And I can, I've certainly, I write listings and, and help real, real estate agents all the time with, um, you know, with this kind of, um, information that they need sure. to arm them with the right data. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah it does. Thank you. Um, so advice there is definitely get your own green appraisal and attach that to the property and with the homeowners, and then it's in the record. Well, also green, remember appraisals are only good for 120 days. Yeah. So you wouldn't be able to use an appraisal from five years ago because it's all comparable driven and they would want to see recent comps no matter what. I mean, in my opinion and experience, I think the UAD is going to become more automated now, the uniform mm -hmm. appraisal. That's why Fannie is collecting data now mm -hmm. so that they have, if you sold that property in the past, it's going to be in their database and they're able to see what's going on with that. But still today, lenders are not considering the Brown discount. They're not considering the C rating the fact that they're lending on a house that is you know at the edge of its life cycle without some love and some you know support of getting it um you know upgraded right Teresa one other question came in uh how are high performance windows treated so I would assume that would be in the e rating you know you well, might Energy that's service. in the HERS. The HERS is going to give you everything you need on the, all of that data goes into the HERS report. Yeah. So when you, when you do um, a HERS rating, all you're giving the, all the specifications, there's actually special forms that have to be completed. I require them for my builders to fill them out mm -hmm. um, so that the HERS rater can get all this certain, you know, who the manufacturer is. What, as an example, I had one that was a Windows and the builder didn't want to, didn't want to do the hers, the, the client did, we went ahead and did it, the, the builders on the phone, we got the hers rater to explain it all to them. And while we're looking at it, he goes, you know, if you change out these windows to this brand, you would say, get another five or six points on your hers rating. And the builder goes, but those are the most expensive windows. He saved the client $20,000, the HERS did, and they were able to allocate that towards solar. So in answer to your question, the whole building envelope yes. is covered with HERS. I also, um, one, other fat, one other piece is I, I required the HERS to be done with and without solar mm -hmm. for a specific reason. You're lending on the collateral of the building. You are not lending on solar, okay? Mm -hmm. When I asked a group of lenders a couple of years ago, I said, what's your definition of green? Eight out of 10 in the audience said solar, <laughs> okay? And only 1% said energy efficiency. It was very interesting and telling to where the lack of education in that sector is. So you got to save energy before you make energy. Sure. So you can put a 9KW or a 12KW solar system and have a HERS that's minus 10, 
but your building envelope can be, you know, below, below code 65, 70, you know, on a hers. So sure. it's really important that we quantify that as a, you know, the building performance for the quality assurance on the lender side. I mean, quite honestly, this saves the lender in knowing that they're getting a resilient long-term quality asset, you know, and this is what I call a AAA asset mm -hmm. rather than the credit side, you're looking at the collateral and nobody seems to look at collateral as hard as they used to. It's more like, what's your FICO? How many reserves do you have? But wow, we're lending on the building. The, the owners, that's their biggest liability is that loan on the building. You know, the right. solar is worth $15,000 after sold tax credits now. Yeah. So it's not a big story anymore. Oh, great. Is that Thank covered you. everything? Yes, that was great. Okay, good. All right, so I want to just go through the talking points now. So the air policy, follow competency rulings, make sure that you are diligent and say, you know, I don't want this appraiser. He doesn't know what he's doing. I want a green appraisal. If you start, if we start demanding it, it will become more relevant to lenders. Um, the other thing that's a misconception in the market is you don't need a, you need a green comp. I need a SIP panel home to compare to a SIP panel home. I need a, really, why? If, you're, if your comparables already out there are a, a brick building, and then you have one with siding facade on it, and then you've got another one that's, you know, I don't know, uh, 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 Adobe, you're still comparing apples to apples a little bit. Every building has an envelope. Every building has walls. So why would you need a SIP panel home to compare to another SIP panel home? You do not need an exact match for the comparison. The right. same with solar. You don't need solar comparison. You, it's like comparing a swimming pool. I'm, 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 I'm um, appraising a home and it has a pool and two other comps don't have a pool. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's the same concept as you don't need an exact match. And I just can't say this enough. Um, and then um, to use the, the HERS is really, you know, something for your baseline energy and also your own quality assurance. Guess what, builders out there? You're going to have less callbacks and you're going to have less, less of um, builder defects when you use this program. Mm -hmm. So why would you not want to use it? Um, Lisa, there's a, one question ahead. that's maybe appropriate right there that came in was, does it only support the HERS rating or are there other types of building certifications that work in lieu of that? That's a great question. And yes and no. Okay. okay. So let me put it this way. If you are putting a lot of money into the building envelope and you're doing SIPs and you're doing, you know, solar and all of these different measures, why would you not want to spend 500 bucks to get an energy performance <laughs> analysis when it's going to be quantified, certified third-party data? Um, the appraisal, now, if it's only an energy store home, I don't say only, I don't mean to diminish that because it's still good. But when it's an energy store level home, you can use the appraisal and um, the, the AI appraisal um, addendum. But, and I do, you know, I have, have, have certain clients that just don't feel like it's worth the cost to do the, or they don't feel like they're going to get enough value for what they're doing, or I don't feel that it's really worthy of them spending the money. I'm going to tell you that, you know, just get a green addendum done. And some of the raters will do a green addendum. Now I don't, um, I don't prefer it for lots of reasons. One a lot of builders and contractors give it to the owner to fill out. Well, that's not a third party certification. If we're, if we're quantifying this, the appraisers, in my experience, do not accept this as readily as they do a third party HERS report. Okay. Does that answer? I think so. So your advice is get an energy rater on the team and uh, get an well, ER. Unless it's, if you're building to code, certainly you don't need a HERS. That, that's my apparent opinion. You don't need to spend the extra money because the, com the comparables that are out there are probably going to work for you. But when you're spending an extra 100K plus, why would you not do it to make sure quality assurance for one thing, but also certification to be able to document what you're doing and have a baseline going forward for that home? Right. I, think I just want a uh, point, of, point of clarification for you, Karen. Um, 
the cost of the appraisal will be higher if it's a green appraisal. Uh, and the premium that Teresa said, yes, was about a hundred to $300 for a green appraisal. Is that right, Teresa? Yes. yes. And again, it dictates, like if you've got a place, a, a appraisal that's rural in the middle of nowhere, okay, and it's on 50 acres and it's a really hard assignment, they're going to charge more for that anyway. There is no set price for appraisals anymore. That's kind of gone out the window. So it really depends on the scope of work, on the assignment, on what they charge. They, call, they charge more for construction. So it's really not a lot more to go for the green side. Plus, my company, Green Energy Money, is giving the data to them and facilitating that data and training them and showing them how to interpret it. That's important. You can do herds all day long and send all this data to the appraiser, but if he doesn't know how to interpret it and to assign a value to it, you just, mm -hmm. you missed the window, you know? Yeah. Teresa, do you have a database of green appraisers? I do, but it's my, and like it belongs to my and my partner's appraisal management national company. And we continue to add them to the, to the list and continue to grow this. So I can do this on a spec side. I've done it for several builders. In fact, one of your board members at EBA has done the green appraisal and it's very, I mean, she was ecstatic that we um, were able to quantify the value for the high performance homes. It was, they were SIP homes in Florida. So I wanna say the appraiser has to be approved by the lender. I mean, I've done these on a spec side for, for builders that they bring to their lender and help them stand it up. Or I go find a lender if I don't have one in that particular region that will let us facilitate the green appraisal side. So all of those are services and deliverables that we can bring to the table. Again, a HERS and a green appraiser without a lender that will participate in this level to recognize it, it's, that's the problem that we're, we're solving and working on one lending institution at a time, one level at a time. And, you know, that, and we're having good success with it. I can say it's our underwriters know now and all of the different entities that we engage with understand this and they, we don't have any problems. And the fact that we've only had one appraisal condition come back since 2014, no loan buyback, speaks highly of the competency of this, this program and the people engaged with it. So here's some case studies that we recently closed. This was the one, one of the ones that was down, the VA one I wanted to cover. Which time do I have here? Um, the, I wanna give time for more Q&A. So, um, the Florida one that we had already done an FHA one like a few months earlier, we used the same data to put into the VA portal. That's the one area we have no control of. VA is very regionally um, facilitated. So each portal and each VA office only covers certain regions. And it's just a, some, a code we're probably not going to crack in my lifetime. I've tried and tried with VA to get them to recognize this. But the bottom line is the, the, the real estate agent and the sales agents that were engaged, all of us worked together. I showed them what to do. I armed them with all the data. And we ended up with a 1% premium. And that was the appraisal in Florida that I got the bad comments that this is there's no marketability for green homes in Florida. I mean, mm. mind blowing. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, that's just the, the bias that I was speaking to in the very beginning. But this was a SIP panel, solar, and I'm going to be publishing these pretty soon here um, on my website. I'm actually doing a whole redo on my website right now. Um, Minnesota, Minnesota. This one hey, was hey. another one that we closed with Fannie Mae. So I'm just showing you that these are conventional homes. I mean, what makes it a green loan, by the way, is the green appraisal. So if you're getting a better interest rate because your loan to value is better, or you're able as a builder, production builder side to absorb that green premium, which guaranteed you're going to need this going forward as market values start to you know, re decline in certain regions, that premium is going to become gold, that it's going to be needed. Um, and this was one that actually I'm filming this one this weekend. We're doing a whole video production. It was Rainwater Soul Source, you know, um, 
metal frame roof, the whole gamut. And I'll be having video production that I'll be um, posting online to show you guys some of the components of this house. It's a community of um, 14 homes that are all rainwater. I think we funded about 10 of them. Um, and it was a really good story. I love the developer. We're still BFFs and it was a fun project. <laughs> Everyone's um, your BFF, right, Teresa? Uh, this what? Everyone is your BFF, right? Well, that's right. I, I just can't help it. I'm in love with humanity. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. So um, Central Florida, um, this was the other, the same builder, by the way, that's on Eva's board. Can I say their name? Yes, of course. Better Homes. So um, this was their FHA loan. So I, what I want to call out here is that this was three and a half percent down and we got builder credits on the VA and the FHA loans that, and that these people literally came in, these, they had gift money. Each of these borrowers came in with hardly any cash to close. Mm. We covered all their green, uh, all of their closing costs in the contract. We structured it in a way and we increased the bat, the price, I mean, the cost, the, the purchase price to include the closing cost, which was a concern from the builder's side because they had had appraisals bust out with VA, FHA before they met us and we started working together. So anyway, it was an exciting story to see this happen. I just want to point out that you're talking about $68 a year for utilities for these houses. Yep. I mean, that's, my, my, my house is about 30 bucks yeah. a month, a month. And it's, it's for 4,800 square feet. Yeah. It's incredible. So, yeah. 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 So that, and it's been like that for years and years, you know? So yeah, this is something that it's a story. Now I don't, well, when I do these, by the way, with the appraisal appraisers, I always kind of, oh, when I'm doing marketing stuff, I'll show higher value for the yearly on marketing because I don't want to, there are certain surcharges that the utility can charge for the grid hookup and there's taxes involved. So it could end up like I'm paying 23. I'm obviously paying a couple hundred dollars a year. So this was what, the, this came straight off the HERS report. It wasn't my data, just so you know. Great. Uh, Teresa, just a question that came in. What about our friends in Canada? Well, I've been to Canada, guys. I want to say one of my worst experiences in my whole career was my presentation to, I can't name the bank, but they're a big bank in Canada. And I had to shut down my presentation and just stop because I just got so many holes blowed in me and they were just so, <laughs> I don't know what to say. They just were not receptive of what we had to do. And but I am able to help on a spec level. I certainly could help. Um, I would love to help, but I kind of walked away from Canada because of that experience. That happened about, it's been a while. I think it was six, seven years ago when I was there. Hmm. But um, it was one of the worst presentations of my entire career. Hmm. But anyway, I will try again. You know, is I'm one of the things I'm known for is perseverance. I just can't give up. Yeah, I have to so, solve the I have to solve uh, the problem. <laughs> Sean, Sean, I would suggest uh, we'll we'll show Teresa's uh, email address at the end. Perhaps reach out to her, and let's see if we can't do because we have energy ratings in Canada. We've got her scores. Yeah, in yeah, and you've got the Appraisal Foundation, which are my heroes, by the way. I love so, those guys, and they're the ones that govern the appraisal um, yeah, guide, so. you know, rules and the appraisal industry, if you will. Right. It's all so, the people. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and you've, you know, that, but the lenders, again, that door was shut. I was open. The guy that was going to do the program ended up leaving the bank while I was literally coming to Canada. So when we got there, the team that transitioned didn't understand anything. And that's what happened. I mean, we, we had a go where I wouldn't have come, you know, in the first place, but I did enjoy all the builder community and all the things and, um, you know, being in Canada, it was a fun trip other than that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is the footprint we're pretty much in right now. Again, we can go in all the contiguous states mostly for most of these programs, but this is where a lot of our footprint is right now, um, where we do have projects underway. We've got builders, we've got, you know, um, 
appraisers in place. We don't have them in all regions yet. We can certainly do it as we move forward, you know, to, to um, get to that story. These are the secondary markets. So secondary market means that's who's going to buy the loans. That's where they're selling. These are the different lending um, agencies, if you will, and, and um, lenders and banks out there that have bought this paper on these green loans that I spoke, I've been speaking about this whole time. So everybody from VA, FHA, Franny, Freddie, Redwood, you know, all the big players and small community banks. I'm a big proponent of working with community banks if they're willing to play in the market with us. Yeah. So Teresa, could you, go, some... could you go back one slide, please? Uh, you. you say targeted market. What's, how do you define a targeted market? We have um, John Snyder on the call that's from Ohio and he sees a pin on his location and would like to hear more. Well, targeted market means that we that there's an adaption happening there. We're getting calls from there. People are interested in doing it. As an example, no calls from Mississippi, okay? So that just means that this is a, remember when I, I'll go back to referring to this slide here. We, what you've got is early adapter or adopter market, and then you've got your mid adopter. So I think mid adaption is happening more in the, um, in the Ohio market now. You're there. You're still on the late adopters in, 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 in Mississippi and, you know, areas like that. Arkansas would be another one, you know, that I consider to be a late adapt, adapter. So just depends on what the market is. But right now we're at that tipping point of this actually occurring on a mainstream level, which is certainly good news to all of us, right, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me go see if there's anything else. So I guess that's it. I just want to thank you all today and just know that I'm here and ready and willing and able to support whatever needs to happen to help you guys, you know, be your best and get your marketability, you know, in place and drive your market to the high performance story. Yeah. And I, I just um, encourage everybody, you know, if you've got questions, if you need help in your market, reach out to Teresa at greenenergy.money. Uh, Teresa, a couple of questions that came in, uh, kind of a, a little bit more homeowner questions, but I think that's appropriate. Regarding the appraisal cost approach, what about homes that have a considerable amount of construction conducted by the homeowner? How does that impact construction cost and subsequently appraisal? Well, it would impact it greatly if you can get the real estate agent to put it in the listing, you know, everything that's done. And those cases, some of them have done HERS, some of them haven't. Um, so I always recommend they go with a HERS. We can get a HERS rating done where they can go in and do the blow. It's already an existing home, so it would be a blow test. There's, you know, the DOE has a pretty, the HESS program can work a lot for retrofits and existing homes. I haven't used the HESS yet. Um, there's not a lot of raters that have, um, that I've found that are able to do it. Hers is more accepted in the marketplace, mm -hmm. um, but you can, a HESS is a little bit less expensive. It's a couple, it used to be, I don't know, I haven't checked recently. Mm -hmm. um, that's the home energy score, which is done by, by um, the Department of Energy. So in answer to your question, Again, it comes down to educating the market because the listing agent can do all the work and get all in there and get everything done right and tight, exactly right. Doesn't mean that the selling agent's going to understand it. Sure. And again, you have another roadblock between the, mar the mar consistent market messaging and everybody understanding the story. Okay, that's the problem we're, we're facing. So we have to educate one brick at a time, literally. Absolutely. And Teresa, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what you were, what we were talking about before we came on with the remodel market and the potential there? That's the next webinar. And um, Aaron, Great. we'll talk about that. I probably would like to do that maybe in April. Um, okay. We can talk about dates um, if it's, if it's available. So um, the, the retrofit, there's over 132 million homes in America, and over half of them are over 30 years old. So there, and there's also the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, 
um, that is has tax credits and rebates available to to homeowners for upgrading their property. So if we can bundle these credits and get state and, and utility rebates as well, there's a way to couple that with loans. So right now we're getting ready to launch the retrofit Freddie and Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, the loan limit is up to 726 now on conforming. Um, and on FHA, it depends on what region you're in, but it can be, you know, high balances. In fact, Fannie Mae can go over a million in Freddie Mac on, on high balance areas, you know, like Boston and Hawaii and San Francisco, areas like that have a lot higher, you know, bandwidth on their loan amount, same with FHA. So these allow you to wrap your construction in to one loan and just like a you know construction loan with an existing home. So I recommend that, you know, this is something that's near and dear to my heart that I feel like we're not going to make our energy goals without having the retrofit existing inventory upgraded. So right. in order to get to that goal, there's only way to do it. And it's regional, by the way, not national play. The reason this programs have been market failures in my experience has been because of the um, not, um, you know, for, for us to not, we've not, now I just lost my thought. Um, because we've tried to do it on a national scale. It doesn't work on a national scale. You've got to have contractors in place, raiders, lenders, you know, the programs are very regional, regionally scaled, not yeah. on a national scope. Great. And Rebecca, I think we answered your question on ERI would be what um, Department of Energy has changed their language to, but hers would be part of the ERI, the HES system or HES system can be used in specific markets, I think Teresa uh, said. So if you have a if we didn't answer your question there, just put it in the Q and A, and I'll try to re-ask it. But Teresa, I'm always remiss if I don't, you know, I don't ask you this when you're here. What do you see in the marketplace right now? Where are things heading? What's happening at the Fed? Well, there's a lot of um, distortion, delusionment, <laughs> delusion. <laughs> I would say, well, what we have now, you know, I hear this every day almost. It kind of makes me a little crazy sometimes because it's like rates are dropping, rates are dropping, rates are not dropping people. The bond market is rallying and hedging against itself. Okay. Prime is still, you know, what, seven and a half now. And I think we're almost done with them raising the rates now. Now it's just a waiting game. My best guess is 14 months before we're going to see. We probably will never see the market. I hope we don't, by the way of mm. what we just witnessed. It wasn't normal, everyone. You know, 3% just isn't normal. You know, you can't make a good balance. It's not a strong, a, a really sustainable model for our economy. So I feel that the rates will, uh, they are relaxing a little bit. I'm getting construction loans below 6% now on a two-time close. Um, there are some price, but this price discrepancies are mind-blowing. I mean, mm. the difference is 8% this place, 6% over here. It's just, I've never seen anything like it where every lender has a very big, very um, differential on their interest rates right now. So they're either buying the market and they're in it hedging against themselves to make, mm -hmm. you know, to, to shore up their risk, or they're just sitting on the sidelines waiting. And they're not, they're obviously, they raise their rates to keep people from demand you know, demand from happening. Yeah, I think so Teresa, we, we heard about um, one of the bank, one of the big banks did a hundred million dollar line at 4.99%. I assume they then hedged it out to protect themselves, but it's a, a promotional opportunity. It's a, so it's a one-off event. It's a yeah. one-off event. So once they're out of that money, we're seeing that now we've got one competitor that's in the market right now in the for same thing on a 10 one arm and they're almost out of money and now they're raising, you know, they, they just, I mean, there's only so much the hedge funds are going to swallow before they go. No more. That's it. You know, you don't get to play more, you know, deeper than dive than that. Yeah. So I don't think we're going to see much of that. Um, just another announcement that just happened. I'm still unraveling the story 
but Fannie and Fannie Mae just added other price overlays um, onto their pricing recently. So they, um, during COVID, they added price overlays for um, like a half a percent higher rate if you were cashing out. If you mm -hmm. were a second home, you know, three eighths to the rate. If you're, so in other words, they're adding let, risk layer okay. pricing onto, to, you know, whatever they consider perceive as higher risk or adding premium pricing onto. So they just added more overlays. What that means, guys, is that you're just not going to see a lot of competitive pricing on the conforming level unless the bank is has a lot of reserves, which is they're going to be running out of reserves, you know, within the next 12 months where they're not going to feel so short fronted. And that, a lot of the the hedging that you're seeing is against their reserves, by the way. So there is a liquidity problem in the market that's becoming more and more um, concerning. Interesting. So you've talked about this electric vehicle program. Can you can we end up with a question there of if we have builders or developers uh, on the call that are interested in something like that? Can you tell us how that works and how you've put that together in the past? Well, I haven't really, I, I put it together. It's a hob, it's a hobbled story, really. But when you consider that, um, like I had one developer in Florida that is a very high-end developer and he wanted to give elevators away because his townhomes were three stories. I said, well, instead of doing that, why don't you lease an electric vehicle as an incentive? So we were talking about it more as an incentive. Mm -hmm. um, so you get with the house you're buying, you get a, uh, 12 month lease for electric vehicle. And then after that, it becomes your problem. So mm -hmm. I think that's one way to shore up the, the um, you know, the incentives of it. And as I said, I believe the future, which I'm right now finishing the second edition of my book, um, which is taking way longer than I thought, because it's so much information. <laughs> it's like a, I don't know what to call it anymore. It's more like a blueprint that you can roll across America. I just keep adding more to it. And it's only a couple hundred pages, but it's a lot of information. And I cover one of the, I, I'm going to cover this more thoroughly. That's the section I'm working on right now, actually. And I think there's a way, actually, I have, Aaron and I've talked about this. I have patents for this where you can add your car loan and your house into one loan. And I think that is the net future product that we'll see rolled out that well, you'll be able to buy your vehicle and car together. I mean, Teresa, I think it would be incredible when you think about vehicle to grid in a high performance home and the ability for the car to be the battery to perhaps not have to add a separate battery to the house. You might want an integrated offering with that car well, as the resiliency backup for that house well not only that but it it it, it closes the gap on the demand everybody's right. concerned about electric vehicles crashing the market well if everybody has their own personal microgrid and i have to be careful how i say that because it's going to freak a lot of people out but really i think the microgrid having your personal grid that you control and in texas you know we're I, I had the ice apocalypse a couple of weeks ago. I was miserable yeah. for three days because even though we have geothermal and solar, we, we're we getting batteries now, by the way. Yes. So yeah. that's another piece I'm adding in my book, which comes with a 30% IDC tax credit. So you that's can right. get tax credits on those now. Um, but I think everyone now that considers solar needs to have the battery and needs to also consider transportation and electric vehicle future event happening because that is happening very quickly now and i don't know if you saw this in the news but tesla's now require their government's trying to push tesla to open their electric vehicle charging stations up to other cost and no other vehicle owners other than them which i think is the right thing to do but you know what do i know <laughs> yeah well Teresa, i want to thank you uh as always it's just incredible to have you here i'm already looking forward to um, the session on retrofit market, because I think that's so critical from a sustainability perspective. And uh, I, I sure hope um, we get a chance to hear you in Salt Lake City, October 10th through 12th for the EBA Summit as well. I will be there with bells on. <laughs> that sounds great. All right. Thank you, All everyone. Right. Teresa, thanks Thank so very much.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks so much, Erin and Nancy. Appreciate you Thanks, guys. Thanks, Teresa.